Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. We are busy into May with one of our big themes being biodiversity. So do head over to our website if you haven't been there already this month, exploringbytheseat.com. We have a ton of May events already announced. And in fact, we just launched a sneak peek uh, of our June events focusing on ocean action for World Ocean Day. So check them out, register for some events with your classroom. And of course, we look forward to seeing you during our live events. Well, it's always a great time when we get to head out into the field on a virtual field trip. And today's is gonna be a really, really good one. We're heading out with the Wilder Institute at the Calgary Zoo and the Bow River Habitat Station for a journey into the land of grizzly bears and one of their favorite snacks, the bull trout. So this is a perfect opportunity to dive into biodiversity and learn a little bit more about these amazing uh, species as well, I'm sure some benefits uh, that there are for their ecosystem. So I'm gonna bring in our crew right now. We have a great team with us right now. I'm gonna bring everybody in for a moment to say hello. We've got Sarah joining us, an outreach coordinator, Ellie, a conservation educator, and Janine's gonna join us for some Q&A action. She's an engagement and education specialist. So Sarah, Ellie, I see you're on camera right now. It's great to have you live with us today. I'm so excited, yes. All right. Awesome. Sarah, we missed your hello. It was on mute. Oh, hello. Good morning, everyone. We're really happy to have all the schools here to talk about biodiversity today. All right. Excellent. Well, before I let you take over, I want to give a few shout outs. We've got a great group of camera classrooms. They're all hanging out behind the scenes, but we've got tons of classrooms saying hi right now. We've got seventh graders in Illinois, grade fours in Thunder Bay, grade fours in Harrison, Ontario, grade twos in Listwall. Grade six is in Ottawa. Grade four is in Calgary. Uh, who else do we have here? Mr. Amaro's grade sixes. Uh, Hamilton, Ontario with Miss Staples and Miss Arbuckle. So keep those greetings coming in the chat. And in fact, we're going to put you on the spot a little bit today with a few questions during the presentation. So if you're a camera classroom, be ready to shout out an answer. You might want to unmute your microphone now. Uh, and those tuning in via YouTube, you can type some of those answers into the chat. So Ellie, I believe you're gonna start us off. So I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit. Absolutely, yes, hello everyone. And welcome to the Wild Institute and the Calgary Zoo. My name is Ellie and I'm one of the educators here. Now, before we do get started, I would like to acknowledge that both the zoo and the Bow Habitat Station are built on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Ayahe Nakoda Nations and the Sutina First Nations. And this land is also home to Métis Region 3. So people have loved, lived and played on this land for thousands of years. And now we're adding stories of wildlife conservation to this land. And I know Sarah and I are really proud about working here and working at the zoo and the bow habitat station. Now today, I know we have viewers from all over the world, but Sarah and I are in the province of Alberta in Calgary, and we are celebrating biodiversity of Alberta. So does anybody know what biodiversity means? All right. Like I mentioned, we're going to put a few classrooms on the spot. Type it in the chat if you think you know. But let's see who should we grab first. Let's go to Mrs. T's third graders and see if they know. What do you think biodiversity is? Who's got a guess? Go on up. Biodiversity is when you have a group of people with different jobs so you can all survive. A group of animals. Animals. I do the venoms. <laughs> so we watched a video where the guy used ninja, so we have that's why we said people. So we a group of animals and we need lots of different animals so everybody can survive. All right, all right. That's pretty darn good. What do you think, Ellie? Do you wanna pop in another class, see what they think? No, I think that was pretty good. Yeah, so biodiversity is all of those living things that are in a habitat or an ecosystem. So excellent job there. Well done. And today we're going to be talking about the grizzly bear, which is a really iconic species that lives here in Alberta. And without further ado, I will introduce you to both of our grizzly bears. I mean, it's very exciting. This is Skokie. He has come right up to the glass. 
So I will just try and scooch over there in just a moment so we can get a better view. So this is Skokie. He's a male grizzly bear and he's 34 years old. And we do have a female grizzly bear too. She's called Kutsamatine. I can't actually see her right now, um, but that's okay. So we might see Kutsamatine in just a moment. Now Skokie is a really, really cool individual here at the zoo um but it's had a really interesting story because he actually started out of his life as a, a wild grizzly bear in banff national park so i'm sure i know there was a class there from calgary i'm sure you know what banff national park is and he lived near lake louise and when he was at just a few years old he'd not really seen humans very much and he was looking and searching out for food. And he came across lots and lots of flowers by the side of the highway. So he started to munch up all of those flowers. And he caused something called a bear jam. So that means when lots of cars stop and they get out of their cars to take photos of the bears. And unfortunately, Skokie was a little bit scared. So he did something called a bluff charge. Now I wonder, Joe, I wonder if you could get a class up to show us what you think a bluff charge might be. Uh, we can absolutely do that. Let's <laughs> go to Mr. B's class. Mr. B's class, what do you think a bluff charge might be from a grizzly bear? You could tell us with words or maybe just show us. What do you think a bluff charge might be? Uh, I actually don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> can I try? Can I try? Wait, they said, wait, they got a bluff charge. I don't even know. I was asking a question. I was asking a question. I think a bluff charge is when they like start running up and like scaring the people away because they're terrified and nervous. That is exactly right. Thank you, Mr. B's class. You are spot on. So he bluff charged these humans, tried to scare them away. But those humans were really scared, so they complained to him about him to the park rangers. Now that was Skokie's first chance. Bears in the wild, they usually get three chances before unfortunately they do sometimes get killed. Um, so that was Skokie's first chance. Another day Skokie was doing what bears do and he could smell something really interesting. So he followed his nose and he came across a campsite. And in that campsite, he found a cooler full of food. So he ripped open the cooler and he had a great day snacking on all this food. He didn't have to find it. But again, he was in a campsite. And when he was munching on that food, he woke some people up and they opened their tent to see a grizzly bear. So I'm sure they were also very scared. So this would have been Skokie's second chance. Now the park rangers by this time, they were getting a bit worried about Skokie. So they trapped him and they moved him three mountain ranges away, away from all of the humans. And they hoped that he would just find a new life there and be nice and happy. But Skokie didn't like it there. So he followed his nose right back to where he came from, right back to Lake Louise. And his third chance was when he actually popped his head into a bakery. So then we knew that Skokie wasn't scared of humans anymore. And he also had become habituated. So that would mean that he could be quite dangerous to those humans. Now, like I said, usually in the wild, bears would get killed if this happened. But luckily for Skokie, there was space at the zoo for him to come to. So that was back in 1996. So that's when he moved to the zoo here. So a really, really long time ago. So I just wonder what could humans have done differently in Skokie's story so that maybe wouldn't have happened to him. All right. So we've heard the story. We know what happened. Does anybody have some suggestions? What could maybe we have done differently? So let's see. You can put it into the chat or I'm going to pop a classroom in here. Let's go with 
Mrs. Brett's crew and see if they have any ideas of what humans could have done. Maybe, like, not in just taking up all the space in nature, so then they would have their own area to, like, be. Can you hear Ethan? Being chased away by the. Uh, that's, that's a really good one. Did you hear that, Ellie? I didn't quite catch that. Could you repeat that, Joe? Sorry. Yeah, he's saying maybe humans uh, couldn't ha didn't have to take up so much space, taking so much space from nature that the bears usually have. That is very true. Yeah, and grizzly bears are classed as a species of concern in Alberta because their the habitat is getting um, smaller and smaller, and we're putting roads in their habitats. So absolutely. So is there anything in particular in Skokie's story? So we know that his first chance he was on the highway eating those plants and people were getting out of the car to view him. His second chance he went into the caps the campsite. About not getting out of the cars. Go ahead. Logan had an idea. Maybe if the people didn't get out of the cars in the first encounter, he would be sort of less, or he wouldn't have the first strike, so... And he wouldn't Absolutely, have been yeah. So if anyone lives in places where grizzly bears also live and black bears, a really good idea would be if you see a bear on the side of the highway or any wildlife, don't slow down your car and, and get out your car to have a look. Just go right past. I know it's really interesting to see them, but we definitely don't want to be getting out of the cars so they can see humans and smell humans. And then I know in Skokie's story, people even started putting food down to get him closer and closer. So he started associating humans with food. Yeah, uh, Ellie, I just want to jump in. Miss Baxter's group on YouTube said they at the campsite, they could have locked up their food better, maybe put it up in a tree in a bear proof uh, container. That is an excellent one. Yes. So a lot of campsites have bear lockers or if they're on bear lockers, you can put them up in the tree in those bear probe containers. And even in your vehicles as well, it'd be a really good one. These are really, really good ideas. Another thing I did want to add as well. So even things that are biodegradable. So that means they break down into the soil. So apple cores and banana skins, you definitely shouldn't be putting those on the trails because they're not natural to the environment for one, and two, bears have this incredible sense of smell. So that is attracting the bears to where the people are. Awesome. Okay. I'm gonna move on now to think about some of the amazing adaptations that bears have. So they're one of the biggest mammals in North America. And they are omnivores. So that means they eat a variety of different foods. They'll be eating roots and tubers and flowers and berries. And they're also eating meat as well. So they are predators. And they eat things like deer and moose and ground squirrels. And fish, of course. So to be an omnivore, they need really sharp teeth. So they have really sharp canines. And then at the back, they have some flat molars. And I do have a bear skull, which I'll show you in just a moment. I've just been following these bears around, so the skull's a little far away. Another thing they have are some really long claws. So grizzly bears have claws about 10 centimeters, and they use them to dig. And this is really cool that we can see on Kutsumatine here. She has this hump between her shoulder blades. And that's something that you only see on grizzly bears. You don't usually see that on black bears and that muscle is for digging so they dig so so much looking for their food it's like kutamitium can hear me she's starting to dig now another one of their adaptations is their sense of smell so bears have the best sense of smell in all of the mammals and it's about 200 times better than humans so if anyone ever comes to the zoo, I like to say that anywhere on zoo grounds, bears will be able to smell you. So if you're eating a hot dog on the, at the zoo, then the bears can definitely smell that hot dog. So I know we didn't get a chance to properly see Kutsumatin. So, so this is Kutsumatin here. And she was born at the zoo. So she's 32 years old and she's a female. What I'm going to do, I'm going to head around to those biofacts so we can get a better view at some of their adaptations. 
So just give me a second. So I have a skull to show you, a bear claw, and maybe some bear poop as well, which I think would be pretty interesting to see. I had to follow them all the way to the other side of the habitat. Ellie, while you're making your way over, there's a question in the chat about how long that the grizzlies can live. Yeah, so they, in the zoo, we said Skokie's about 34. We're not 100% sure of the age he was when he arrived here. Um, but in the wild, they tend to only live to be about 25 years old. Yeah, so just because they're at the zoo, they're getting veterinary care, and they're also get fed every single day so they live a little bit longer all right very cool no worries if you're ready i can show you now our biofacts so this would be a grizzly bear skull you can see those sharp canines i was talking about you can see that they have flatter back teeth there and then in their nose, this is a real skull. So you can see all of those bones in their nose and that's called turbinates. And they're just these folds and the more folds that they have in their nose, it means you've got a better sense of smell. So humans, we definitely wouldn't have that many folds in our noses because our sense of smell is not great. So like I said, 200 times better than ours. And it just increases the surface area so smell particles can land on those terminates. And then that message goes to the brain about what they're smelling. This is a paw print here. So you can see compared to mine, just how big it is. It's absolutely massive. I'm sure you all know what this is. This is their fur. So grizzly bears are called grizzly because the tips of their fur is slightly lighter in color. So that is called grizzle, hence why they're called grizzly bear. And there is subspecies of brown bear. So if anyone gets those two confused, all grizzly bears are brown bears, but not all brown bears are grizzly bears. And then we have these two claws here. So I'm wondering, we have this smaller one and this bigger one. Which one do you think is the grizzly bear? Have a little think. I think it's this one, the smaller one, or this one. All right, let's check in with Mr. Botcha's grade four crew. What do you guys think? Which one's the grizzly? Yeah, James, what do you think? The one to the right. The big one. Yes, absolutely. Because grizzly bears, they do lots of digging. So they have these shovel shaped claws, whereas black bears, this is from a black bear, they have much smaller claws, and they climb much better than grizzly bears. And we do have three black bears here at the zoo too. So in Alberta, there are two species of bear, black bears and grizzly bears. And I did want to show you that poop, because who doesn't want to investigate animal poop? So here is some real grizzly bear poop. And you can see that they have lots of plant material in there. Um, I can't see any bones, um, but because they are omnivores, they would also have that bones in there as well. Now, this is really interesting. I did want to show you, because this is what we would call a fish popsicle. So that isn't actually a real fish inside of there. This is just a model of one, but we sometimes do give the bears fish popsicles. So we freeze fish in these big ice blocks and put them into their habitat. Can anybody think why we might do that? All right, let's go to the hardy party this time. Why might they freeze and make those fish popsicles? Probably for like enrichment or something to help like remind them of home or something. <laughs> That's smart. <laughs> That is amazing. Yes, it is for enrichment. Animals at the zoo, we cannot feed them live food and they don't have to spend as much time as animals in the wild looking for their food. So we do, we give them lots of different types of enrichment. One of them is this fish popsicle that they have to figure out how to, to break open the ice to get to their fish. 
Another thing we might do is put lots and lots of smells in their habitats and sometimes even smells of different animals. So we might put mountain goat poop in there or bighorn sheep poop in there. So they're using their senses to smell those animals that they would be eating in the wild. And we don't just put their prey species smells in there. We would just think put spices in there and perfumes as well. So anything that gets them using those senses that they would do in the wild. Okay, so I have given you quite a lot of information there about bears. I'm just wondering if you can put it all together and think about why bears might be really important to their environments. Okay, we'll give the classrooms another second and we'll give a couple seconds for some YouTube answers to come back in. How those senses coming together would be really important uh, for their environment. And then we'll grab a classroom or two and see what they're thinking as well. Uh, let's see. Let's go. I see someone front and center in Mr. B's class. I wonder if that's a signal they might have an idea. Um, my idea why grizzly bears are important to the wild is because maybe it's because their sense of smell is they can smell anything in the wild and the wild they know where their home is in the wild because they set tracks but if they were in a city or somewhere i don't think they would survive because there's no grass there's no fish and there's no food or any or water or anything you are exactly right there yeah so grizzly bears they definitely wouldn't be able to survive in 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 places like Calgary or in the cities. Um, but why do you think they are so important to the environments that they do live in? So they, in, in Banff National Park, they're living in the Rocky Mountains and in the foothills. So why are they important to those environments, to those ecosystems? So we've got an answer online. Miss um, Quigley's group is saying that they're an important part of the food chain. So like a keystone species. Yes, I love that keystone species. Excellent. So they are keeping those prey numbers down. So things like deer and bighorn sheep, they're keeping those numbers down. There's also something really important in their poop as well as they, they go around and they're eating berries and flowers. All right, let's see what I, somebody thinks about the berries and the flowers. That's a really good clue. Why is that important? Uh, in their poop. Let's try Miss Breton's class. Miss Breton's class. Oh, first, my head is so <laughs> what do you think? Friends at the back, what do you think? Uh, like used for uh, fertilizer or fertilizer and or can uh, be used as food, I guess. Yeah, they probably like help the earth with the fertilizer when they go. The nutrients? <laughs> Anybody else? Definitely. Definitely. No. <laughs> so that's fertilizer, definitely. But what what uh, do you is usually found inside a fruit? Let's give a little clue. What's usually found inside a fruit? Like maybe to help the fruit grow as fertilization, well, and it also like moves it around in all the other areas. Yes, exactly. So seed dispersal. Yes. So they work around their habitats. They have huge ranges. So they will be dispersing all of those important seeds. That is excellent. Well done, everyone. Now, I think Sarah is going to talk more about their relationship with fish. So I think we're going to head over to Bow Habitat Station now. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bow Habitat Station. Uh, thank you, Ellie, so much for all that amazing information on grizzly bears. It was super cool to see their, how long that their claws were, and you can see Kutsumstein digging a little bit with those claws. So here I am at Bow Habitat Station. We are a part of the government of Alberta under the Ministry of Environment and Parks. And what we do here at Bow Habitat Station is that we look to inspire positive and meaningful environmental action through hands-on learning experiences related to Alberta's fish, water, and ecosystems. So I want to start off today talking a little bit about a relationship between bears and fish. In the neighboring province of British Columbia, 
There are salmon species. They're part of the Salmonidae family. And these salmon, they spend part of their life in salt water. And when it's time for them to lay eggs, they travel from salt water back up the rivers to freshwater streams. And this is called the salmon run. I'm sure many of you have may, may have heard of this. And the salmon run is like a big feast for bears. So all these pears come around and eat the fish. But the story gets a little bit deeper because when the grizzly bears take these fish, they bring them to shore, they eat the fish, but then there's leftover fish sitting on the shore, maybe sitting underneath the trees. And these leftovers are really full of nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus. And these nutrients soak into the soil and then the trees can take up those nutrients and grow bigger and taller. So the fish actually feed the forest thanks to their relationship with grizzly bears. So it's really cool to see this, this relationship between the grizzly bears, the fish, and the forest in British Columbia. And this research is ongoing by people and fisheries biologists in British Columbia and even places like Alaska and Washington. It's very, very cool. But these salmon, these salmon that spend part of their time, time in the ocean, they can't travel all the way across the Rocky Mountains to where we are here in Alberta because of something called the Continental Divide. So I'm gonna just throw it over to the kids here. Does anyone know what the Continental Divide is? All right, Continental Divide. Let's grab another classroom here and put them on the spot. So let's go with Mr. Watch's crew. What do you think the Continental Divide is? Anybody have a guess? Um, Henry, do you want to talk a little closer? Oh, don't stand oh, okay. it. Was it when that giant meteor hit the ground and then it split up all the Okay, so we have a guess of a giant meteor hitting the ground. Maybe. All right, let's try another crew here. What do you think the continental divide is? Let's go, Mrs. T's grade three. We haven't heard of them for, for a little while. What do you think the continental divide is? Huh, go Maya, give a guess. Maya's going to give us a guess. Yeah. I think what a continental divide is where two um, two parts of the earth meet together. That is sort of what it is. And it has to do with rivers specifically. So we're going to share a picture with you. And it's a map that shows kind of these different meeting points on uh, our part of the world and in Canada here. So if you're looking at the picture here now, you see a couple of different colors. So I want you to first take your eyeballs to the red color. So that, that kind of is part of BC, British Columbia there. And all of the rivers in that red region flow towards the Pacific Ocean. Now take your eyeballs next door to Alberta, the province of Alberta, and you'll see colors orange, blue, and just a little bit of yellow at the bottom there. So in Alberta, the rivers flow to either the Arctic Ocean the Atlantic Ocean, or even down to the Gulf of Mexico through the Mississippi drainage. Okay, so on this map that you're looking at, you could see that Alberta is super, super far away from all of the oceans, right? So what that means is that all of the fish that we have in Alberta, where me and Ellie are, they're all freshwater fish. And there's 65 species of freshwater fish here in Alberta. So some of them are swimming around behind me here. Uh, these guys are in the salmon family, but we call them trout because they are uh, a freshwater fish. So these trout behind me here, there is Okay, it looks like uh, we may have had a signal interruption or maybe a wrong button. We just lost our crew. Uh, at the bow station. So we're going to give it just a moment for them to come back in uh, and join us. Maybe while we wait, I'll bring Ellie back in for a couple bear questions. Um, but I have a feeling it won't be, it won't be too long until we see. <laughs> I think you'll notice that maybe something disconnected. Uh, okay. Uh, if you have a bear question, let's start off with Mr. B's crew. 
I think they're out in California. Do you guys have a bear question? Um, since since the since the grizzly bears are really good at um good at digging, have they ever dug under the fence? <laughs> that is a good question. So we do make sure that the cement goes really far down so they cannot dig out. And we do not want to have any grizzly bears escaping. As we said, the <laughs> bears and humans, they don't really make a very good match. So we do make sure all of our habitats are nice and safe. All right. Well, good timing. We got a question in. We have the habitat station back. Uh, we'll let you continue. Oh, and just off that. There we go. We got to loud and clear. You were just talking about um, the the trout, how they're in the salmon family, but called trout. Yeah, totally. So back here, all these guys are trout back here in the the aquarium behind me. And there's one trout in particular called the bull trout. And the bull trout is the provincial fish of Alberta, and it's a very cool little fish here. Uh, I don't see any swimming past right right now. But let's have a closer look at maybe identifying what a bull trout would look like if you saw one. So I think Michelle, yeah, got, there should be a picture up on your screen of a bull trout. So you will see a bit of coloration, but not loads. They've kind of got like an olive green color, a little gray on their back. Their sides might be a bit silvery with some spots that are either kind of like a pale yellow or red. So these fish, they can grow to be like 30 centimeters to 80 centimeters, which is about one ruler to even three rulers. They can weigh up to 10 kilograms, which is like two bowling balls. But the best way to identify a bull trout is by looking at what it doesn't have. It does not have any black on its fins, okay? so. We have a saying, and it is, no black, put it back. But why would we want to put it back in the water? It's because bull trout are actually a threatened species at risk. So when you're out fishing, there's a zero possession limit on bull trout. That means if you catch a bull trout, you have to release it back into the water. Now, bull trout populations, they are pretty low, so our grizzly bear might not find many bull trout out there to eat at all. And there's three main reasons why bull trout are actually threatened, and we call them the three H's. So we've got habitat, we've got harvest, and hybridization. So I'm going to break those down real quick for you. The first one is habitat. So bull trout have experienced a little bit of habitat loss and even a little habitat degradation. The second H is harvest. So that's sort of what I was talking about before. People maybe caught too many bull trout in the past, or maybe people illegally poach and catch these fish. And then the last one is hybridization. So these bull trout species, what can happen is they can actually breed with other invasive species of trout, like the brook trout. And that kind of harms their genetics, those natural populations. So we've got these three reasons why bull trout are threatened, which is, is kind of sad. And it's our job to try to take care of these fish. I want to tell you something pretty cool that fisheries biologists do to research bull trout. And it is called a red survey. So I'm going to start with the word red here. Red is a nest that trout build. So trout, they do not build their nests out of trees and sticks and stuff like birds. They build their nests underwater. Um, kids, does anyone know what material trout build their nests out of? All right, let's put a class up here. Let's go to the hardy party. Where do you, what do you think they make their nests out of? I think they make their nests out of like seaweed and stuff. That is a good thought. Thinking about what's underneath the water. Think what's at the very, very bottom of a stream. Yes. Oh, Riley, come on. The bottom of. They, did they use like rocks? They use rocks. Yeah, totally. 
So a female bull trout, she'll find a nice little area with some nice little rocks and she'll make a nest to lay her eggs. Now, another question for you. Can anyone guess how many eggs a bull trout can lay? All right, another great question. Let's see. Uh, Mr. Botch's class, what do you think? What's a guess? How many eggs can they lay? Nice and loud. Um, like 20 or 30. Okay, we got a 20 or 30. Let's try Mrs. T's class and see if they have a guess. How much eggs do you think that the, they can lay, the bull trout? Mike, what do you think? Maybe a few thousand. A few thousand, Mike says? That's right, actually. Anywhere. Good job, Mike. <laughs> awesome job. Yeah, it's so true. They can lay anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 eggs. Can you just imagine for a moment having that many brothers and sisters? It's a lot of eggs. So what fisheries biologists will do, they'll go out into a stream, and the streams that they find bull trout in and bull trout spawning in are in the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains, and they're kind of like clean, cold, clear, and connected waterways. So we'll f they'll find a stream that would have bull trout. They'll walk up this stream and look for reds. They'll look for the nests with all of those thousands of eggs in it. So by fish biologists doing this, we can start learning a little bit more about where bull trout are living and spawning, maybe what their habitats are looking like, and even how many bull trout are still living out in the wild. So the more we can learn about these wonderful fish, the better we can be at taking care of them. Okay, now there are a couple of things that people like you and me can do to help bull trout. So I'm gonna run through a few of them. Some of them are kind of simple. The first one is handling fish. So I don't know if any of you have been out fishing before, but if you are to catch a fish, not just a bull trout, but any fish at all, you want to be really gentle with that fish, right? You want to be gentle with that fish. And of course, you want to keep it in the water because fish belong in the water and that's where they breathe. So you want to keep your fish underwater and gently take its, the hook out of its mouth or take a nice picture underwater. So that's the first one, super easy for us to all do. Another thing you can do is protect bull trout habitat. So maybe that's cleaning up after yourself, a little bit sort of what Ellie was talking about with grizzly bears too. Of course, another thing if you're out fishing is to clean, drain, and dry your gear. Because think about if you're wearing rubber boots and you go from one river to another, you can track things like germs on those boots. So it's always good to clean them. Also checking for things like other invasive species that maybe shouldn't be there like goldfish. <laughs> of, uh, let's see here. Do you guys have any other thoughts on how you can help and protect bull trout? All right, let's see here. Where haven't we been in a bit? Let's go back to Mrs. Breton's crew and see if they have a guess. How can we help and protect bull trout? Go ahead, Ethan. How can you protect bull trout? Uh, I guess you could like try and like making awareness for them. Education and making yeah. awareness posters and things so people know. Yes. All right, that's a, that's a really good one. Let's try another class, see if they have an idea. Let's go to Mr. B's class. How can, what do you think we can do to protect uh, bull trout? Maybe not litter or throw trash in the water. That's a good one, absolutely. Let's try one more class. Let's go to the Hardy Party. Do you have any ideas for how we can protect bull trout? You can protect gold trout by um, either putting a fence around their habitat or by um, putting signs that say that probably would say warning. Um, and that's a, I can't that's a good idea. That sign one's a really good idea by the rivers. <laughs> Lily, did you have something different? Um, yes. Go ahead. 
not being destructive to their habitat or like destroying stuff where they live. Good one. Very cool. Richard, you have something? Oh, looks like we're out. All right. Let's bring, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, those are all great. Educating each other, cleaning up after yourself, even putting signs, maybe so people don't drive things like ATVs and quads through a trout nest a red. Those are all awesome ideas. The very last thing I'm going to mention here today is something very cool that we have beside us here at the Sam Livingston Fish Hatchery. It's another way we can protect bull trout. At the hatchery, we raise fish all the way from teeny tiny egg up to a fish for release. So really quick here, I'm just going to show you what fish eggs look like. Just to have a bit of idea. So we get little fish eggs like this, and we raise five different species of trout here at the Sam Livingston Fish Hatchery. We raise brook trout, brown trout, cutthroat trout, um, tiger trout, and rainbow trout. So these fish are raised all the way from an egg up to an alevin like we've got here. So these little alevin guys here, if you look close, you might be able to see their big yellow belly. That's their yolk sac. So that's all of their nutrients and food. So you have all these little guys here. And then our little alevin will grow up to be fry. So I've got some little fry here as well. So these fry, they don't have a yolk sac anymore. They don't have their food attached to their body. So they have to go out and find their food. They have to go out and eat their food. Okay, so those are the first three life stages of trout that we raise here at the Sam Livingston Fish Hatchery. And once they get a little bit bigger, once they're young adults, they're getting to that age and size where they will be able to be released out into lakes and ponds across Alberta. And at this fish hatchery, we raise and release over a million fish every single year, which is pretty cool. So how does this help a bull trout? Basically, as we raise fish and release them into lakes and ponds, we can relieve pressure on natural bull trout populations. You can kind of think about it like um, people are still able to go out and recreationally fish, but they're not harvesting our lovely little bull trout. They're fishing other fish that we've put into the water. Now, there are other hatcheries in the province of Alberta that do raise genetically pure native trout and do look at releasing them into the wild to help those native populations as well. So there's a whole bunch of really cool strategies that professionals like fish biologists can do, but there's also a lot of really important things that people like me and you can do to help our fish populations and biodiversity. So everything here in our ecosystem is connected like a puzzle. Biodiversity is like a bit of a puzzle. And each species is like a piece of that puzzle. Grizzly bear is a piece of the puzzle. Bull trout are a piece of the puzzle. And even remember that forest connection too. So our biodiversity and our ecosystems would not be complete with all those really small pieces of the puzzle. So I want to thank you guys so much for uh, listening to this talk about bull trout and fish in Alberta. I think we're going to move into our Q&A period right away, and I'm going to welcome in Janine, who is an education specialist, to help answer questions for us and as well as Ellie, I suppose. All right. Welcome, Janine. Great to have you joining us today. And thank you to uh, everybody who's been with us today, Ellie, Sarah, for such great presentations, learning uh, so much about the bull trout as well as the grizzly bears. Very cool. Well, we have tons of questions. We're going to dive right into it. We'll take some from the chat. We'll take some from um, our live camera classrooms. We're going to start off. We're going to take a trip to Surrey, British Columbia, and we're going to bring in Mrs. T's third grader, Chance. Hey, third grade champs, how you doing? Great. Say great. Great. We're on camera, guys. We got you front and center. Hello. So anything's fair game. Questions about the trout, the grizzlies. Um, Go ahead. Um, so my question was, how much time do grizzlies bear um, uh, sleep? Oh, well, you know what? Pen night, I'm not 100% sure, but we all know 
the grizzly bears go to sleep for the winter. Now, lots of people call this hibernation. But you know what? It's not true hibernation because hibernation is when animals go to sleep in the fall and they don't wake up until the following spring. Whereas grizzly bears, they do something called torpor. And that's the same as black bears too. So they can wake up occasionally through the winter. They might wake up, go for a pee, see that there's still snow on the ground and then go straight back to sleep again. Because if there's snow on the ground, there's not going to be much food around for them. So I know Skokie and Kutsmatin, they usually start heading to build their dens and go to sleep in December and they wake up around April. So pretty much for those whole four months, they'll be sleeping, but they do wake up occasionally. But every night, I think they're pretty similar to humans. I don't know if Sarah and Janine might know more, as I know they know lots about grizzly bears too. I do not know how long they sleep per night. It seems like okay. <laughs> I also am not sure how much they sleep per night. That's a really great question, though. <laughs> All right. Well, the hibernation facts are really cool. It's uh, I think there's a lot of us who probably like to hibernate through winter. Some of <laughs> maybe don't love that cold time of the year. Uh, okay, Mr. B's class is joining us in California, and I think I see someone front and center. There we go. Oh, can you grab the mute for me? How do you get the bear skulls, the paw prints, the fur, and the claws from the bear? Oh, a good question. Yeah, so um, the baskel was a real baskel, so that would maybe have come from either a bear at the zoo that's passed away, and we asked the veterinary team to save some, some bits for education. And you can also buy some skulls as well. So you can buy replica skulls online. They look exactly the same as the real ones. They're just a little less fragile. But that baskel was a real one. Um, I'm not sure if it was an animal that was from the zoo or if it came from Parks Canada because we do have a relationship with Parks Canada as well. So if they find any bits like that in the wild, then they, they do offer it sometimes to the zoo to use. All right, very cool. I'm gonna grab a question here from YouTube. Uh, this question is about the bull trout eggs. So uh, you mentioned two to 5,000 eggs. This class is wondering, is that spread out over the year or just one go? So yeah, it can be 2,000 to 5,000 eggs and bull trout spawn in the fall. So you would see them spawning sort of in that kind of September, October time of the year. <laughs> All right, let's grab another YouTube question before we bring in another camera classroom. Uh, let's see. Oh, I like this one. Uh, Ms. Baxter's class would like to know, how do you track the bears in the wild? Because you talked about three strikes for Skokie. So how are bears tracked in the wild? Yep, I am going to head back down to where those biofacts are because I did actually bring a radio collar with me to show you. So give me a second and I can show you. So the bears will get sedated and then we can add on these radio collars just around their neck. So I can show you right now. So sometimes you might see images of bears with these collars on. They don't affect the bears at all, but these will just send out a little signal and researchers can tell where bears are and when. So that is what we call a radio collar. All right, very cool. Great questions coming in online. Mr. Botch's fourth graders are in Ontario in Canada. And they have a question for us. Here they come. Excuse me. How do you protect yourself when a grizzly bear attacks? What do you think? Another, <laughs> another great question. Um, so it depends. Honestly, they can have different types of attack. I would say always make sure if you're in bear habitat, make sure you're with a group of at least four people. There has never been a, an attack on a group of people that has four people always carry bear spray as well and and be ready to use it and know how to use it as well would you add anything else sarah and janine over there i think one of the best things that you can do when you're out in bear country 
is make a lot of noise. So as long as the bears can hear you coming, they'll often leave and then you won't actually have an interaction with them at all. So uh, that's kind of the very last thing that we want is for a bear to actually come in contact with people, uh, which is why we really do encourage having that bear spray with you and making lots of noise beforehand. All right. I'm going to keep you front and center, Sarah and Janine, because we have another question coming in here via YouTube, uh, this time about our fish friends. So our class here is wondering about the coloration. So you talked about kind of a silvery color. They don't they don't have the black on the fins. Is there any reason why maybe it's kind of such a plain silvery color? Well, you know what? All fish are different. So just like people, fish can look slightly different. So when we talk about bull trout, we try to talk about the key characteristics. And so with all trout, you'll see um, them change their color throughout the year based on the things that they're eating, as well as the time of year. So when bull trout are spawning, that's when they start to get more of the uh, really bright sort of colorful spots along the side of the yellow to red spots that you might see. Um, but quite often their, their color is quite plain, like Sarah had said, um, and that does help them to camouflage. Um, so because bull trout live in really clean, clear water, uh, they'll like to hide sort of down in the rocks to avoid predators. Good question. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Ms. Quigley's group is joining us. They've sent in quite a few questions. I'm going to pick two of them here uh, from the chat. So they're wondering about any predators of a grizzly bear. And, oh, I lost the other one. Where did it go? Oh, and do they have a favorite food? We know they're omnivores, so they eat lots of different things, but is there something that just really gets a grizzly bear excited? Good questions. So predators of grizzly bears, no, especially not the adult ones. They are huge, huge mammals. Um, the babies, I don't even think they would get eaten by anything, honestly. Um, and then their favorite food, I know at the zoo, they do love to eat horsetails. So they do go crazy for those horsetails when they get here. Um, and also lots of different fruits as well. Oh, and another thing I may add is peanut butter. So one of the animal technicians did let me know that one of the things that they, they do use when they're training is peanut butter because that's one of their favorite foods, which is something they probably wouldn't find in the wild. <laughs> All right, very cool. More in those campgrounds if you leave your cooler out or something like that. Uh, okay, uh, camera classrooms, give me a wave if I need to come back your way if you have a, a follow-up question. Oh, Mr. B's class, there we go, you're in. If you had to pick an animal in the zoo, what would be your favorite animal? All right. Well, that's a hard question. <laughs> that's mean. Um, ooh, what is my favorite? You know, every day I have a different favorite. I do love the bears, especially in springtime when they start coming out. It's always exciting because you've not seen them for so long. Um, but then in the Africa section, I do love the giraffes too. Do you have a favorite? Tigers, white um, tigers, white it would have to be probably a panda bear. Oh, nice. We don't have giant pandas here, but we do have red pandas. All right, uh, Janine and Sarah, let's put you on the spot. Oh, for our favorite animal? Yeah. Actually, I might like those more, red pandas. <laughs> very cool. My favorite animal at the zoo is the snow leopard because they're very, very hard to see out in the wild. So it's a really unique opportunity to see um, an, a really unique animal. Yeah. I like the rock hyrax. They're very cool. And my favorite fish here maybe is like the tiger trout. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds fancy. Very cool. Uh, okay. Let's visit Miss T's in British Columbia one more time. Um, I was wondering, how do you get the collar onto the grizzly bears? Yeah, so someone would have to use a sedation gun. So um, they have to have a really good shot and, and, and shoot it with this drug. And the, the bear will go to sleep. And then you can pop the collar on then. So you definitely don't do it while the bear is awake. That would not end well. <laughs> All right, very cool. Great question. Let's take one more from YouTube today. Um, Ms. Alexander's class is tuning in with us and they're wondering, uh, they didn't specify, but maybe we can talk about it for both. Uh, is there a way to easily spot the difference between a female and a male, maybe size, maybe coloration? 
Let's start with the grizzly first. Is there an easy way to tell the difference? No, not really. The males are tend to be a little bit bigger, but you know, you could have a small male and a big female. So there isn't an easy way to tell the difference. No. Okay. And what about with our fish? Is there any size differences or coloration? Not hugely. I know during the spawning season, the male salmon or the male trout will kind of get an elongated lower jaw and that's called a kike, but that's only during spawning season and then it'll kind of get reabsorbed. What about you, Janine? Do you have any tricks? No, with fish, you know what? A lot of the time it's actually very difficult to tell them apart. And when our fisheries biologists are out working, really the only way that they can tell a lot of the time is if it's spawning season and they actually check if there's milt or eggs inside of the fish just by squeezing their belly nice and gently. So very hard with fish to tell them apart. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to start off with a huge shout out to all of our classrooms, to our YouTube classrooms. Thank you so much for sending in so many great questions today and joining us from all over the United States and Canada as well. A huge shout out to our camera classroom. It's so great to have you joining us live. Uh, a few have had to duck out for recess and lunches, but I'm going to bring a couple of them back in if they want to give a good wave here. There's Mrs. Keys crew. There's Mrs. Keys crew. And then, of course, a shout out to our fish and our bears who were so gracious to show up and, and hang out on the camera with us. That was so cool. And Sarah, Ellie, and Janine, thank you for joining us today and sharing so much uh, amazing knowledge with us and really sharing those important ecosystem connections. Uh, you know, you look at those different habitats from the grizzlies on land to the trout and in the water, and you don't always see those connections and how important they are. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, yeah. thank you so much. I had so much fun. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. I hope everybody has an incredible weekend and we are gonna sign off for now.